And Jerome, uh, thank you, Jerron. Uh, thank you very much. That was kind of where I hung my hat. Back in the day when I was playing with Uncle Rico. Are you going dancing later? Why? Because you like my shirt with flowers on it? Yeah. It's to distract the weight I gained during the summer. <laughs> now I want M&Ms. How Don't did worry a mosquito about it. Focus. Get in here? Focus. <laughs> this is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline is the great Jimmer Fredette, friend of the program, BYU basketball all-time great. Jimmer, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing great, guys. How are you doing? And we're fantastic. Solid. And I, you're always a busy guy. You've always got stuff going on. But now you throw multiple children into the mix, Jimmer. So how are you balancing your time with basketball and everything going on there now with two kids? Yeah, no, it's it's a different dynamic now. Um, you know, Whitney and I are playing man-to-man defense, and uh, we're having a good time doing it. But uh, it's 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 been great. I mean, little Taft is three months old, and Wesley's two and a half. So I mean, we're busy. We're switching on and off. Obviously, I have you know a couple workouts a day normally, and then Whitney uh, you know rides her horses and does her workouts and her things that she wants to do. So you know, we're doing a, a lot of. Uh, a lot of um, switching on and off and, and watching the kids and just having a great time. So, I mean, it's it's definitely busy, but I wouldn't have it any other way for sure. Spencer has three, I have two. We can empathize uh, quite a bit with this situation. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. What, was oh, the, yeah. what was the process like as the Sun decided to forego the second-year option, but the Warriors picked you up for the summer league? Yeah. Um, you know, as we got towards the end of June, you know, the, the – Suns had an opportunity to either pick up my option or not, and we found out that they were going to decline. And as we found that out, we we kind of put the feelers out to see which teams would be interested and in, and in everything. And um, you know, Golden State, you know, talked to my agent, and you know, they they're very very interested, and they wanted me to come, you know, be a part of their summer league team. And I think a lot of it, you know, has to do with trying to see who I am as a person, but also get them at me in their gym and try to see me in their system, see what I would be like and uh, what I can do. Uh, to provide something for them. So, uh, you know, we decided to to take this opportunity. So I'm grateful for it and uh, excited to be here, you know, with, with Golden State for the Summer League and, you know, see how it works out. When does your training begin with the Warriors in terms of working with those guys, that team, and in their facilities? It starts today. You know, I, I just got here last night. And, uh, you know, today we'll take a little bit of physical, uh, do a little physical, and then uh, we start practice tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm here now and, uh, you know, started to get this process started. Is here Vegas or, uh, Oakland or San Francisco? So we're in, uh, right now we're still in Oakland, um, you know, at their, their old practice facility. And, you know, obviously they're getting a new arena, new practice facility, you know, coming up pretty soon, but, uh, well, I'm here in Oakland and be here for a training camp. And then we go to Sacramento July, you know, July 1st is our first game. And we played, um, you know, in Sacramento for those next three days. Well, there's going to be a, a couple of Cougs playing for the Kings uh, in, in Childs and Mika, so perhaps there's a fun matchup there, right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I'm excited to be able to see those guys and, you know, compete against them. And obviously it's great to have, you know, BYU guys, um, you know, in the summer league and, uh, you know, have three on the same court at the same time is, is something that we haven't seen in a while, I don't think. So that's, that's really, really cool. Jimmer Fredette with us on BYU Sports Nation. Just signed a deal with the Golden State Warriors to play in the NBA Summer League from July 5th through the 15th. A lot of BYU fans and a lot of Jimmer fans, for that matter, are excited about you and the prospect of being on a team like the Warriors because they feel like your game and how you have approached the game translates well with that franchise. How do you feel your game fits in with the style of the Warriors? Yeah, you know, I think it fits right in. Um, you know, obviously they uh, they get up and down. They shoot a lot of threes. Um, they're great in transition, um, ball screens, catch and shoot, whatever it is in transition. Um, and then they move and share the basketball and uh, really, really, um, you know, are unselfish with it and try to play the right way. Um, and that's how I try to play uh, throughout my career. And, uh, you know, as I've gotten older as, as a player, I've learned to play a lot more off the ball, being able to move without it, catching and shooting, and being able to play on the ball and kind of playing that multiple positions. And that's kind of how, you know, the Warriors like to play their game. And, um, you know, I'm very, very good in transition. That's what I try to do. And, um, you know, so I think it fits in really well. I think it's one of the best fits um, as far as um, the way the style of play for a team um, is for myself in the NBA. So, um, you know, I think it's a great opportunity. And, 
and uh, now it's time to go out there and just play. Jimmer, you've had some great memories in Las Vegas, and uh, so I, I think BYU fans are especially excited to watch you play in Las Vegas again. I'm not sure where the games will be played. Maybe you can offer some insight to that. But how do you feel about being back in Vegas specifically? Yeah, you know, it's, I've been to Vegas many, many times and uh, have played there a lot, especially in the Thomas and Mack Center and, um, you know, the Cox Pavilion and everything that's there. So, I mean, it's fun to go back. Um, you know, it's always fun to play in that arena. I've had such great memories there. I've had some really tough memories there as well, but uh, we've uh, had some amazing memories there. So it's it's a cool arena. I mean, um, the Summer League is getting bigger and bigger, so it's always you know, sold out crowds and people that are coming to watch and, um, you know, be great atmospheres and playing against great competition. So, I mean, uh, you know, hopefully can go out and put on a show for some of the fans that come on and, and show up to watch us play. As long as we don't hear the Rebels chant, we'll be fine, right? Yeah, that was the worst chant, man. <laughs> I mean, I, just, that, is, that thing is, they just did it nonstop. Oh. And most of the time when we played them in their building, we lost, but we but we had the last laugh, finally, the last laugh, the last time we played them. So that's all, that's all that mattered to me. <laughs> Indeed. Good, uh, good memory to finish on, right? Um, someone, yeah. someone simulated you in NBA 2K with the Warriors with Steph and Clay. Did you see this video? I know Ball is Life put it out and said, teach me how to jimmer the third Splash Brother. <laughs> I haven't seen that video. I haven't seen it. I'll have to check it out. But, uh, yeah, I've heard, th- I've heard that a little bit. <laughs> it looked pretty nice. And I-, I wanted to ask you about this. You talked about your development off the ball. Um, I-, I-, I feel like in your career you've thrived when your usage rate is high. How have you tried to develop that where, okay, perhaps I don't have my, the-, the ball in my hand as much, but I can still thrive. And do you feel like someone's going to give you a shot to perhaps have more usage? Um, you know, obviously – I think for most people, you know, the more times you touch the ball, the better you're going to do. And, you know, for myself in particular, but, um, you know, the last couple of years in in China, I've really, really focused hard on being able to play without the ball in my hands and being able to still be, you know, effective and score the basketball. And I've done, uh, you know, really, really worked hard on that. And, um, and it's something I've definitely gotten better at because I knew that if I did want to make another run to the NBA, I would have to play that way somewhat, you know what I mean? Maybe uh, there'll be a team that will uh, let me have the ball in my hands some and, and be able to direct the second unit or whatever it is. But, um, I know that I'll be playing off the ball a lot as well. And being able to catch and shoot and spot up shoot and move without the basketball is something that's super important for myself. So I've just worked on that a lot, and I feel a lot more comfortable doing that now than I ever have. And, um, you know, so it's uh, it's important that I did that. And, um, you know, I just try to find, you know, just try to find a situation where a team wants me to be on their team. And then from there, you know, you just got to work, work your way back into the system, work your way into, you know, the rotation and try to find and do anything that you can to just get on the court whatever that may be, and then from there, you know, show what you can do, show your worth, and, you know, try to get more usage rate as you go. Jimmer Fredette with us on BYU Sports Nation talking NBA Summer League basketball. He's going to play with the Golden State Warriors from July 5th through the 15th. I know there's this understandable idea that, oh, this is a tryout for the Golden State Warriors, but the Summer League is bigger than that. How much of this is about just trying to find an NBA home by playing well in the Summer League? Yeah, you know, obviously – you know, all 30 teams are watching all across the league, um, you know, when you're playing in a summer league. Um, you know, my, my idea and focus is to come here to show the Warriors, you know, what I can do in their system. And, um, you know, I think that they're, they're definitely – there's some interest there for them to be wanting to be on their summer league team. So to be able to show them what I can do in their system, and that, that's obviously a huge priority for me is to be able to do that and, and maybe be able to be a part of their team next year. But like you said, every team's watching. So you just got to go out there and put your best foot forward, and you never know, um, you know, what's going to happen. But um, like I said, a great opportunity to show what I can do in this system and, and try to impress the Warriors as much as I can. And, and then, uh, you know, you never know who else is going to be out there. What's the latest with uh, Jim Morosity? Things have been great. Things have been great with Jim Morosity. We just uh, opened up a, a second all-inclusive playground um, over in Pleasant Grove this last week. Fantastic. And, uh, in the Discovery Park, yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing park. So I, uh, you know, want everybody to get over there and sh- bring their kids over there and just enjoy a day or whatever it is and, and have fun. And, um, you know, we just had another successful 3 and 3 basketball tournament um, for our anti-bullying campaign and, and uh, continue to get more support and more people to come 
um, and get involved in, in our process and what we're trying to do um, all around Utah County and all the way in Utah. So we're, we're, we've been very, very successful. Things have been going great. Um, you know, people have been loving our programs, and uh, we're, I'm just grateful to be able to have such support in Utah for the people to really, you know, help us out and to keep this thing going and uh, to have it grow each and every single year is, is something that's been special, and we hope to just help as many people and as many kids as we possibly can, and it's been, it's been awesome. It's great to hear that. And, Jimmer, of course, the basketball tournament approaches. Your brother TJ is uh, the general manager. Dave Rose is going to be the coach. You're going to be an assistant coach. Tyler Hawes, BYU's all-time leading scorer, is going to play on the team. What do you expect out of Tyler and your guys in the basketball tournament? I'm excited for it. You know, uh, you know, you know, to have Coach Rose come and help us help us coach is something that's really awesome. And, uh, you know, he, he doesn't necessarily want to be known as, as the head coach or anything like that. Um, he wants to just be kind of a coach and do this all as a collective group. And, uh, you know, but I'm sure once we get into the game, he'll, he'll have his, his two cents, but I, you know, one thing that I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to at least call him off at one time. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I've never had the opportunity, never had the opportunity to do that. So I feel like I gotta, I gotta try it at least once. You know, in my in my life, um, so that'll be fun. But I'm excited to have Tyler on the team. Obviously, he's a he's a great player, great scorer, and uh, someone that can really you know put up big numbers when he gets in the right situation. And we plan to put him in a good situation to be able to go out there and help us help us advance, help us win. And um, he's a, he's such a great guy. I just saw him a couple of weeks in Utah and talked to him for a little bit. So I'm excited to have him on the team, and uh, as well as all the other guys. And, you know, we have a great team, and, uh, you know, my brother did a great job putting together this this uh, this team, and now, you know, being able to help and have it in Utah, hopefully everybody will come and watch us. Now, what if you blow off Coach Rose and you call a play, and then Tyler blows yep. you off? Then what? Yeah, see, I'll take him out. <laughs> yeah, we, can't, we, can't, we, can't, we, can't, we can't be having that, you know what I mean? Like, especially if I if I do something, you know, blow off Coach Rose, and then he does that, yeah, and that's, that, we can't have that. So yeah. I think Tyler understands. I think Tyler understands that, but uh, no, it'll be it'll be fun. He he can do whatever he wants when he gets out there. As long as he's scoring the basketball, I don't care what he does. <laughs> I would love to see that sequence. That would be amazing. You can't stand for insubordination, Listen, Jimmer. Get a get a twenty point no, lead, then not. you can mess around I'm for not a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Jimmer, let's uh, give you some BYU Sports Nation karma for the summer league and the basketball tournament. Uh, utilize it. We hope and wish the best for you, man. It's always great to talk to you, and thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And send our best to uh, Whitney and your beautiful children. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate you, and hope to talk to you soon. All right, Jimmer Fredette on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, your values, your timeline, your financial future. Hopefully he crushes it in the summer league, and that whether it's the Warriors or some other team, is like, okay, we're going to let you be the guy off the bench, the Patty Mills, like, ro- like g- just let him have the usage rate and, and see, right? And And I've said it before. I think Jimmer is a tremendous non-NBA player in the NBA. They're not giving him the usage rate where he can be the most effective. So I think he's most effective outside the NBA. But if he's still in the NBA and he's getting at least a decent opportunity. Utilize him how he can help you. Sure, sure. Yeah, we all want to see Jimmer thrive. Utilize him in the way that he can best help you, which is put the ball in his hands and just let him go to work. Is there a team that will let him? Is there a team? Yeah, and like you said, he's been working on uh, off the ball. I do like that he's in Las Vegas. And oh, it is the summer league because and it's I, the Warriors is awesome. I feel like this is kind of, I don't know. It's like this is like the last bastion of hope because well, all these things are aligned. It's like yeah, we let thought, him do his thing. I thought that with the Spurs, so I'm glad that he's had a chance with the Suns and now the Warriors. So we'll see. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. All right, Jerem, it's time that we visit the top 10 defenses BYU football will face in 2019. It's Jerem's 10 and 10. 10 lists in 10 weeks. It's Jerem, 10 and 10. That list at Idaho State and UMass, they stink. Number 10, Liberty. Liberty, Liberty. New D.C. Scott Simons comes from Memphis. They run a 4-2-5. That's about the same amount of yards the Flames gave up per game, and you're one of FBS independents. 
Liberty was in the bottom 15 of all major defensive statistical categories, giving up 37 a game. Jesse Lemonye had 10 sacks last year. Lineman Austin Lewis was a freshman All-American. That's a win. Liberty about to give up 37-plus against BYU and Provo. I would hope it's 50-plus. Number nine, South Florida. In Charlie Strong's sophomore year in Tampa, the Bulls got worse on defense, allowing 39 a game and 470 yards the last six all losses. Ooh. Middle linebacker Nico Sotel missed the final seven games with a neck and shoulder injury, but is healthy. Greg Reeves pulled a Sioni Taki Taki and moved from end to linebacker his natural position. Four of the front seven return after being eighth worst in rush yards allowed. The pass defense, however, 35th, two of those four starters back. So what you're telling me is this is BYU's best opportunity to beat a team in Florida. Nailed it. Number eight, Toledo. In 2018, the Rockets gave up almost 31 a game, 432 yards a game, had the max worst pass defense. Zach Wilson is hungry. Giving up 44-plus against the first three FBS opponents. That'll do that. Maybe it's good only five starters return then. And Jamal Hines had three sacks, six tackles for loss as a freshman. Converted tight end Jordan Fisher is the top returning tackler. Suspect defense still worries me because this is the first game after the gauntlet power five games in the first four. Yeah, Toledo's a good team. What they're really good at is offense. Number seven, USC. The Trojans lost a lot of linebackers, including three-year leading tackler Cameron Smith, Utah native Porter Gustin. They were middle of the pack as a team a year ago with defensive coordinator Clancy Pendergast, who's in year four of calling the plays. This group led the nation in sacks two years ago, but slipped with 17 fewer last year. The secondary is an issue as well. Athletic, but just half of the DBs are on scholarship. I'm feeling good about this because BYU's offensive line seems to be deep and talented. If the pass rush for USC isn't there and the secondary is an issue, hello, win over the Trojans. But it's always scary because you see those three letters, right? Yes. Number six, Tennessee. Derek Ansley runs a transitioning 3-4 defense that gave up 28 a game a year ago in the SEC. The defensive line needs to replace four starters who produced, oh, 150 tackles and 15 and a half tackles for loss last year. However... The Volunteers have a good secondary, led by freshman All-American Bryce Thompson. Expect a lot of nickel. They'll be juiced. Second game of the season. They're going to be 1-0. 100,000 plus. Yeah. Like this game, I'm concerned. Yet I have them at six. <laughs> Number five, Utah State. They felt disrespected the last couple of weeks. I'm throwing you in the top five now. <laughs> Seven starters return to the nation's top takeaway group. They had 32 last year. They also scored six touchdowns. What? First-year D.C. and former Cougar linebacker Justin Enna is calling the shots now. He says the D-line is the strength of the group. Three starters back, including Tipa Nali, I had 10 and a half sacks. Linebacker David Woodward, NFL prospect as well, 134 tackles, 12 and a half for loss, five sacks. Senior corner D.J. Williams, four picks, 11 pass deflections. Basically, he was the 2009 Brian Logan. Yeah, I'm... Which I, was better than the 2010 Brian Logan. Yeah, th- listen, the Aggies... They can ball, man. I know we're all still trying to get used to this, but they've, they've got some ballers, man. Little brothers growing up. And Justin Ennis calling the shots now for McCook. Number four, Boise State. Defensive coordinator Andy Avalos departed to Oregon. The Broncos will switch from a 4-3 to a 3-4 with Jeff Schmetting and Spencer Danielson. Curtis Weaver, baller. Plays the stud position. He's, he is one. 15 tackles for loss, nine and a half sacks last year. This group produced seven picks all year. Tied for its lowest total since 68. Seven starters are back. Nine with at least nine starts from a group that was top 40 in scoring and yards. As good as Boise State is on defense, they got to come to Provo with a new quarterback. I like BYU in this game. And it's his name's not Zach Wilson. He would have been their guy. No. Now he's BYU's. Take that. Number three, the surprise pick here, San Diego State. Rocky Long and his defenses, man. The 3-3-5 is alive and well, led by DC Zach Arnett. Who's playing the Aztec? What? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Former Aztec head coach Brady Hoke is the D-line coach. That's weird, right? Not he was the head coach? Not, yeah. Now he's the D-line coach. 22 points allowed last year, 7th in the country in rush D. Held Boise State to 229 in an upset on the blue. Backer Chiava Tozino had 127 tackles, 14.5 for loss, 8.5 sacks. Safety Tariq Thompson had 7 picks and 3 forced fumbles the last 2 years. I like this defense. I'd be concerned, but their offense is so bad right now, I don't know if they can score enough to beat BYU. Yeah, they, it feels like the 2012 BYU where the offense was meh, the offense defense was fantastic. Number two, which will tell you number one, Washington. 
This group has been the strength of the UW program for years. Five defensive players were taken in the NFL draft. Three the year before, four the year before. They reload every year. Two starters are back on a defense that was fifth in points, 12th in yards. Safety Miles Bryant and Benning Potoai. UW led the nation with one play allowed of 40 plus, by the way. Do you know who was second? It was BYU with four. See, I don't know about Washington. This is the great mystery for me because they sure. lost so many elite players to the National Football League. But like I said, they lost five this year, but they lost three the year before and four the year before. So they've done this, right? There's this trend. Two years in a row, they've lost guys. And, and the top defense BYU play in 2019 is the Utah Utes. Great news. Are the Utah Utes. This group is fantastic. Seven returning starters give up 19 a game, only 4.6 yards per play. Top 20 in both. Kyle Whittingham feels like he has three NFL defensive linemen. And Bradley and I, Lecky Fotu, and John Penicina. Linebackers are questioned, but Cougar defectors, Francis Bernard and former signee Mika Tafua, good players. Jalen Johnson, outstanding corner. Julian Blackman, expected to move from corner to safety to fill the shoes of Marquise Blair. And those are the top 10 defenses BYU will face in 2019. Utah keeps uh, arriving, if not at number one, at number two in all of these lists, James. So why do we feel like BYU has a shot to beat the Utes? Well, they they have a shot. I don't think they should win. You you and uh, Jason had a conversation about, "Ah, yeah, I think they should. I'm like, should? No, they shouldn't. They could, (laughs) yeah. I hope with all my little heart that they do. Come on. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline, longtime friend of the program, all around good dude, still working on that golf handicap probably as we speak, David Nixon. David, welcome back to the show. Hey, what's going on, fellas? How's the summer treating you, my friend? Uh, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a great summer. The weather's been great. Um, and uh, like you said, golf's been great as well. You and I golfed just, uh, what, a week and a half or so ago? Yes, and you played much better than I did for the majority of that, so congratulations. It's, it's, it's always hit and miss. Don't worry, Spencer. <laughs> Look, David, I know, I know you've played some, some courses, some really impressive courses. What's the one you haven't played that's on the bucket list? Pebble Beach. And I've got, I've got to get out there soon, but that's that's the one that's still on the list. I haven't played is Pebble. Nice. So, but so we're going to do a BYUSN uh, Pebble Beach Day here soon enough. <laughs> so get, get get your get your clubs warmed up there, Jason. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're working on we'll that. We'll do. <laughs> Dave, uh, huge news with BYU football last week with Media Day. Of course, the news that Neil Pau uh, he has an uncertain football future after he was arrested for his DUI. And then, of course, all of these position changes. That has us thinking, specifically with Diane Gawoluku, who said he's going to play cornerback. You're a defensive guy, David. Which is the strongest position group on this BYU defense after some position movement? I, I think it has to be that secondary. I, I think with Diane uh, back there, I think you got Austin Lee, you got Troy Warner. You've got a lot of guys that have experience. That was one of the positives from last year with everyone going down with injuries and being banged up is you had a lot of these younger kids, Malik Moore, um, that they, they got some work. Chris Wilcox, of course, has been kind of a mainstay back there, but D'Angelo Mandel, uh, Isaiah Heron. I mean, there's a lot of guys that, that were out there playing uh, last year that, that got reps, and uh, you know now they're ready to – they've had some game experience and now ready to go out there and play. So I think that's secondary. I think the backers will be solid, um, and there's names that we're familiar with, but you got Zane Harrison coming off injury, Isaiah Kafusi coming off injury. So you got guys that have been banged up a little bit. They're going to they're have to you know, shake off some rust. Um, but I like that secondary. And then, of course, the, the defensive line, you got the, the mainstay, which is you, you always need a strong nose tackle because he really is the anchor of your defense. You got Kyrus Tonga, who's arguably the best defensive player this year uh, on the entire unit. Um, but, um, you know, you look at, you look at the roster for, our, for BYU's defense, and it's solid up and down. Um, and, and when you ask what's the you know, strongest unit, I think you say secondary, but I think we'll we'll find that this linebacker crew, uh, once they kind of get a chance to gel together and go out there and, and do their thing, I think you'll be surprised by them. And then defensive line, I think you're, you'll see guys that will uh, kind of emerge and, and be go-to guys, uh, Bracken O'Bakery and Trajan Peely. I, these type of guys will emerge and, and be true playmakers. David, whether it's a, a position group or a storyline, what's your biggest question regarding this team right now? 
I think offensively, you look at, you know, Zach Wilson had a fantastic year last year, but who is he going to throw the ball to? And I think that's the biggest worry, especially now, as you mentioned at the beginning of this interview with Neil Powell being out. Um, I mean, you look at the, the receiver crew, Gunnar Romney, Micah Simon, Talon Shomway, Aleva Hifo, Dax Milne. You add up all their touchdowns from last year combined, that's including Neil Powell, combined nine touchdowns. That's less than one a game. Um, and so there's, there's just not a go-to guy in there right now, and, and I think that's what has to emerge. Of course, you got Matt Bushman, Roe and I coming back who um, are your studs. And, and, in fact, Matt Bushman, out of those receivers that I mentioned, had more receptions and more yards than any of them. Um, and so I'm not worried about the tight ends, but I'm saying on the, on the wide receiver, when you need a guy to run a nine route, when you need a guy to run a fly route down the field who can stretch the defense vertically, who is going to be that guy? Who's going to go up and, and make a play for the ball and go for it? I don't know. And I think, of course, we all hope it's Gunnar Romney or Talon Shonway. They've shown some, some flashes of brilliance. But at the end of the day, there's just not a lot of experience there. And frankly, there's not a lot of production. And so the biggest question mark for me on, on the offense side of the ball, and frankly for the entire team, is the wide receiver crew. And, and I know Fessy Stock, he's coaching them up. He's doing a great job there. But um, somebody's got to emerge. Because you look at BYU's teams in the past, they've always had an Austin Colley um, or a Cody Hoffman or a true playmaker to go to when it is third and eight and you need a first down who's your reliable guy and i think right now there's some question marks around that crew so um that that's for me is the the one area that cause is a cause for concern but i'm also confident some will somebody will step up to the plate and uh you know make a splash david nixon with us on byu sports nation former byu outstanding linebacker four years in the nfl we're discussing the 2019 byu team And, David, this is a loaded question, but one that we've been bouncing off of each other here in Studio B for a while now. What would qualify as success in terms of a win-loss record for BYU this season, given the difficulty of the schedule, or at least we think it's difficult because of what we see on paper? I think, listen, you've got to have a winning record, first and foremost. I, I think seven and, a 7-5 seven and five type approach is, is where you need to be. Uh, but then I think you take small victories in there, and I think you look at it as uh, kind of seasons within a season, right? Um, and, and BYU's first four brutal games. Can you come out of there 2-2? Two and two? I think that's a victory. Um, and then as you move throughout the season, can you protect Lavelle Edwards Stadium? Can, can, you, can you win at home? Um, and, and so for this team, I, I think the grand scheme, yeah, you can throw out there the 7-5 and five or 8-4, and four, uh, whatever it may be. Um, but I think BYU needs to kind of move beyond that in, in the sense that they, they've got to win at home. And that's something that, you know, Spencer, you and I were talking about. My, my last three years there, we were 18-0 and 0 at home. And, uh, you know, playing at home was special. And that was a place that you protected. And that, you didn't let teams come in there and beat you up. And, and some, that's something that this BYU team has struggled with in years past is, um, you know, play, playing at home. In fact, we joked last year when they, they won at Wisconsin, there was a while there that they almost played better on the road than they did at home. And there were some comments uh, by certain players players kind of backing that up. And so uh, they, they've got to get back to, to owning uh, the, the, the field at home and, and playing well there. But, um, you know, it's a tough schedule. In fact, arguably probably the most difficult independent schedule we, we've had, uh, top to bottom. And you, you look at the depth of the, of the schedule. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think that's what's most exciting is this is what, as a player, this is what you want. You want to play these four P5 schools to kick off the season. I mean, you want to play on the biggest stages, and that's exactly what they're doing. So the opportunity is there, and the question is, can the team take advantage of it? David, you could not have set up our next question any better. Obviously, the focus, at least to begin the year, is on that first month with all the P5 teams. Now, you do have you know, three of those at home, which is certainly a good thing. Which of the first four games do you believe are winnable? Uh, all of them. I mean, you you go back you go back to last year. Nobody thought BYU could go into Wisconsin, you know, ranked sixth in the country at the time and beat them, you know. Uh, but this team believed it, and and frankly, as a competitor, as a as a football player, you have to think you can win. You, you, when you step on that field, you have to go out there and know that I'm going to beat that team. And maybe it doesn't happen, uh, but you've got to have that confidence. Otherwise, you're going to lose every game. So those guys are training right now. They're running sprints. They're out there in the heat, uh, lifting weights. It's miserable right now, uh, but they all have that goal in mind: is is win that first game kicks off against Utah that they're prepped and ready and that they can run the table and and uh, put it all together but um, from a realistic perspective I, for me I don't think there's any reason why they can't go two and two I, you know it's well documented Utah's gonna be their toughest game in that whole stretch I mean they've returned a lot of horses um, and, and and they've got a lot of experience on that team um, where, whereas in the rest of them I think there's there's some key 
positions that were up for grab. You look at Washington, new quarterback. Uh, USC has kind of been in flux a little bit. Um, Tennessee, I think they're still trying to find their identity. So there, there's teams that are frankly almost the same boat as BYU, and, and, and that they've they've got great tradition. Um, and they've had flashes of brilliance throughout their you know last decade or so, uh, but they're all kind of in this pattern of, of trying to figure themselves out. So um, it's a great time to catch Tennessee and USC. Uh, of course, Washington had a fantastic year last year, but they're rebuilding a little bit with with the talent that's left. Um, so for me, there's no reason why BYU can't go two and two in that in that first you know month and and come out of there with uh, you know some 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 guys have gained that experience and they're ready to roll throughout the rest of the schedule. David, over the weekend, conference realignment was floated back out there into the sports stratosphere, and people took it and ran with it. UConn. <laughs> is going back to the Big East in all sports except for football. And now their football team is left to wonder, are they going to be a member of the American or are they going to end up in CUSA? Are they going to end up in the MAC? Or are they going to go independent and go the BYU route? And then all of a sudden BYU fans are thinking, well, maybe the Cougars should take the Husky spot in the American because it's time. Does BYU to the American Athletic Conference make any sense to you? First off, you have to love June and July when when the NBA finals are over and there's just not, there's no sports on. So of course this stuff gets floated out there to try to occupy us for the next two months. And I actually can appreciate it because it actually uh, provides some type of entertainment. Um, here's the thing: I, unless the AAC can go out there and get you know poached from the Mountain West and try to create try to be really the first superpower conference out there with a 16-team conference where they can go get BYU, Boise State, take the cream of the crop of the Mountain West, um, you know, San Diego State. If, you, if they can pick off those teams and, and, and maybe try to create that big power conference, uh, super conference, if you will, I, I think maybe it's worth looking at. But if not, if it's, just a, you know, if it's just a swap UConn and BYU out, I think that's just a lateral move, and I don't think it's worth it by, by any means. Um, but if, if they can set the trend of, of trying to be the first mover, um, like I said, maybe it's worth entertaining. I still think BYU, of course, just continues to hold out, continues to r- ride the wave of independence, and hope that uh, you know in a few years, whenever whenever the, everything's expected to shift again, that they're in prime position to be sw- you know, swept up in, into one of those P- P5 conferences. But um, I think it, you know seeing what the AAC can put together, I think it's always worth entertaining because maybe you could, maybe you could you get uh, kind of a western side of the AAC, uh, so where your your traveling's not as bad as as it might be, but um, you know, it's fun to entertain. I, I just, I, I still think a P5 school is, or a P5 conference is the way to go. And uh, it's only a matter of time, I think. Uh, and, and yes, waiting in the meantime is painful. Um, but I don't, I don't think BYU is desperate by any means. Um, and I don't think it's worth jumping ship uh, just because there's a, there's an opportunity. I think it's something that Tom will have to evaluate and uh, continue to kind of monitor the landscape of, of what's going on out there and, and make the best decision. Thank you for bringing logic to that question. David, it's it's a weight game for sure with the, those big Power 5 contracts on the TV side coming up in 2023 and 2024. Great stuff, man. Uh, follow him and his blue check mark at D underscore Nixon. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon, brother. Okay, awesome, guys. Take care. You got it. Pebble Beach trip to be determined. I think he said he was going to foot the bill for that, right? Well, that was inferred, I, David, wasn't it? David's headed in a direction professionally that... Uh, That's inferred. I... I I'd probably lean towards him being the uh, primary financial support for a trip like that. (laughs) Sweet. Pebble Beach, here we come. There we go. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. One week ago today, BYU football held its annual media day, and as usual, we were privileged to get an even better in-depth view into the football team and staff with Jason Shepard and Lauren McLean hosting the web chats. So for now, we hand it over to Lauren for her best of BYU web chats from media day in Between the Lines. BYU Sports Nation presents Between the Lines. We had a blast doing these interviews. It was hard to pick our favorites, but we think we did it. This is the best of the web chats. Who would be the first to break it down at a dance party? It's me. Is it Colin? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Unanimous. And even when my legs are hurting, I can do the upper body movement. <laughs> and head. 
Belly dancing. For all occasions, yeah. Who wins in one-on-one -on -one between the two of you? Between us? Yeah. Oh, it's not even close. I would dunk on Gennaro. <laughs> what are some of the ways that your last name has been butchered? Gana Woloku. It's like they just see it and they just make their own word of it. The first thing and they just make everything else of Gana Woloku or Ty Detmer, guacamole. They have their own inside jokes. They have their own style. How are you feeling? Feeling good. Recovering well. Um, just taking it one day at a time. What is each other's hidden talent? Singer. Singer. Oh. Oh, Singer. Uh. Give us a line. Give us a little. Uh. <laughs> wow. Who was a mama's boy? Who Again, both of them immediately yet. right. <laughs> oh. Hey, actually, you're right. She said both. Uh, the best of lines kind of run themselves, and so. Rumor has it that you and Zach are kind of the ladies' men of the team. That's not me. Heck no. <laughs> All I'm saying is Zane knows a lot of ladies. <laughs> a lot. Zane. So right is now that, we're the that same height. Tinder profile? Do you put that? What are you talking about? What are you talking legs? about Tinder for? <laughs> Stubbing the legs in there. I don't know. On Christian Mingle. Yeah, my mom was like, what should we make for the farewell? I'm like, let's just make Pop-Tarts. So what is the status of your health right now? I'm trying not to look too far in the future, but I feel comfortable with where I'm at, and my body feels good, and I'm optimistic about the future and reaching my goal of the first game. They, they have their own way of doing business. We've come up with what Lauren and I believe are some pretty clever <laughs> names, instead of calling you guys hogs. The voluptuous piglets. Oh. Yes. The last one we have come up with, the ham -ers. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Hey. the hammer. I was in Walmart, and um, I was, like, checking out my bags, and the lady just, like, started talking to me. She could tell, like, I wasn't from around here. She yeah. asking me questions and, like, you know, just being, talking about the people and stuff like that. And then, you know, at the end, she invited me to the movies. <laughs> like, I've only known you for, like, five Listen. minutes. We have some mullets that we think are rank in some of the best ever. Where are you ranking John Beck's mullet? <laughs> now that one's just good looking. That's a good looking dude right there. <laughs> name the two main co-hosts of BYU Sports Nation. Okay, I've heard the name Jerem Jordan. Yes. Oh, yes. he's got the last name. Yes. Okay. Oh. And I could not tell you who another person is. I'm not going to tell Spencer you, you remember okay, Jerem's I'm name, sorry. not his. Which coach is the fastest eater? Tails. 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 You both I just saw him up here. Oh, yeah, I just saw him. Where, where is he? He wants to go eat some. We're gonna tell. We're gonna tell. <laughs> back. <He's never> <laughs> Oh, Skyler Southam is my favorite kicker. Yes, right now. Yeah. Jake Oldroyd, you know I love you too. Yeah, Jake knows us. <laughs> Those guys need to talk to Jake about getting the names of the BYU Sports Nation. Who, That's right. Oh, was uh, was that Trey Harris? No, sorry, uh, Mitch. Mitch Harris. Mitch Harris. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. His cousin Trey works here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really, really fun. Gennaro Guilford is hilarious, by the way. He's really funny. That's great. Oh. If you missed those web chats, by the way, I th maybe you'll go into this. You can, uh, you can learn a lot on, of they're stuff. They're all on YouTube. They're all on YouTube. You can go to uh, the BYU TV app. I believe they're on demand there as well, but uh, sliced up by pair on YouTube. So, Great job by Lauren awesome. McClain, Jason Shepard, awesome. and the Between the Lines crew to put together the best of the web chats. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Stadium Sports College Football Insider Brett McMurphy. Brett, we joked last time that uh, we had you on the show that we only bring you on when we're talking college football realignment or conference well, expansion. Here we are. Yeah, here we go again. Are, are you ready to do it again? <laughs> Try to get out, and they keep pulling me back in. <laughs> <laughs> Brett, in your opinion, why would the American Athletic Conference perhaps be a good fit for BYU right now in 2019 or in 2020 moving forward? Well, I, I disagree with the, your Facebook poster, and the reason is that you mentioned is because of the New Year's Six game. If you're, not, if you're an independent and you're not a Power Five like BYU – then basically you have to go 12 and 0 to play. Let me rephrase it. You have to go 12 and 0 to have a chance to get into a New Year six game. BYU can go 12 and 0. There's no guarantee they're going to be ranked high enough to get in. If you are in the American and you are 11 and 2, you're the highest ranked champion from the Group of Five leagues. Then you will play in the Peach Bowl or the Cotton Bowl or the Fiesta Bowl. If you're an independent and you're BYU and you go 11 and 1. 
you go to the Heart of Dallas Bowl or some other nondescript bowl. So as far as motivation, as far as what it would do for the school, I think it would mean more for the school. I mean, look how UCF has grown based on going to these New Year's Six games, and obviously their national championship, of course. Don't forget that. Um, <laughs> I mean, they people know about UCF. I mean, I live in Tampa. Ten years ago, UCF was an afterthought. And I really think BYU should should be aggressive with this. I've heard uh, both sides on whether Army has any interest in joining a conference. Ultimately, I don't think they would do it. And other than Army and BYU, sources have told me there's nobody else the American's looking at. And the American, at the end of the day, may just stay at 11, kind of like the Big 12 stayed at 10. But I just think if BYU wants to get into a power conference – Let's fast forward six years and say there's conference realignment. One last merry-go-round. Would BYU be more attractive if they were an independent that won, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten games a year for the next six years and went to whatever bowl games you can think of? Or would they be more attractive if they had won three American conference championships and gone to two New Year's six games and upset a Power Five team in one of those bowl games? Well, I think you know, my opinion's worth nothing, but I think they'd be more attractive. Certainly, they would move the needle more going to the New Year's Six games, winning the conference championships. Those conference championships are on ESPN. I heard you mention the ESPN deal. The American just signed a new deal with the with uh, ESPN where it will average $7 million per school per year. So they'll be on ESPN the same as they will whether they're independent or not. So ultimately, though, it's a preference. There's not a right or wrong answer, but if it was me at this point, I would go ahead and do it because then if you if you dominate in the American, then you can show the Big 12, you can show the Pac-12, you can show whoever else may want to expand. Man, these guys have really upped their game. They've proved they can win, and quite frankly, they proved they can get along with others in a conference, which, no offense because I love you guys, but one of the, <laughs> one of the negatives about BYU is that, that people in college athletics believe the school is a pain to deal with. And so it's almost like a, you know, you're kind of showing everybody what you can do, almost like a job tryout. You can stay independent till the end of time. That's fine. You're going to have trouble <laughs> scheduling games in November and that sort of thing. Or you can get into a conference, and then that would lead to bigger and better things. That's just my opinion. Is this a football-only scenario, Brett, or is this an all-sports thing? Which is the better scenario for both sides? But football only, because I, I don't think neither side wants to send their Olympic sports halfway across the country to play. You know, you're not going to send, uh, you know, you don't want BYU going to play East Carolina in, in women's basketball and the same thing, East Carolina coming out to BYU for for an Olympic sport. So, no, I think it would be football only. Uh, that puts them at 12 in football. Right now they're at 11 in basketball. There's been some speculation they may try to add VCU as a as a basketball member. But, no, I think it – you know, you guys have a good home in your Olympic sports now. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't move those because those – geography is much more important for the Olympic sports than for football. So I think it would be football only. And I think that's really um, – with Army and BYU, that's all the Americans looking at is football only membership. I don't think they want Army as full members either. Let's explore what you said a minute ago, and and I tend to agree with several of the points, not all, but several, with the BYU kind of being hard to work with, right? I feel like BYU has leaned a lot on, okay, yeah, we won a national title. We had a Heisman Trophy winner. In fact, we're the last non-power teams to do that. In 6 09, there was a nice run of 10-plus wins every year in top 20 and whatnot. Do you feel like BYU needs to validate all of this competitively with a 10-plus win season, something that kind of splashes in the next couple of years, if they don't go to the American and, and make the splash that you said? The, the challenge for BYU on the national level is that you guys can win 10, 10 games, and because you're an independent, because you're not in the running for the New Year's Six games, there's not a lot of interest nationally on, wow, are you guys, you guys have a shot to get in one of the New Year's Six games. And that's unfortunate. It's not fair, but that's, that's the reality. So uh, I, I think you kind of fly under the radar. And, you know, you talked about, you know, winning a, a national title and, and w- winning a Heisman Trophy. I mean, those are great points. And I'd go to the American, hey, you know, we won a national title just like UCF. We won a Heisman Trophy just like Houston. 
you know, bring us bring us on board. But also, it's what have you done for me lately? And, sure. you know, that's kind of the issue with UConn. I, I know in no way am I comparing you guys to UConn. But since they went to the 2011 Fiesta Bowl, they've had eight consecutive losing seasons. You know, they've won three or fewer games five of the last six years. They were 1-11 and 11 last year. You know, they've fallen and they can't get up. So that's why they're moved to the Big East. So the past history of – past history. The history of BYU is tremendous, and it's an attribute. But you also have to – you know, what have you done for me lately? And that's what a lot of these athletic directors and officials at the conferences are looking at now. Brett McMurphy of Stadium Sports with us on BYU Sports Nation. We're talking conference expansion, realignment, go figure. It's what we do every time when uh, he joins us. But financially speaking, would BYU make more money as a member of the American Athletic Conference football only or staying independent with ESPN? I believe they would make more with the American. I actually, before I came on the show, I tried to Google it. I reported, and I can't remember the number. Back when you guys did the deal with ESPN, I had a source tell me the number that BYU was getting per year. I know it's a private school. I don't think BYU's ever commented officially on what the number is. I think um, Jay Drew, Salt Lake City, reported a different number, maybe a little bit higher than what I reported. But, no, ESPN is not going to pay BYU $7 million a year because that's what the American schools are getting. Uh, they're getting $84 million a year. Divided by 12, that's $7 million a year. They're not going to pay them $7 million a year. Why? Because they don't have to. Um, you know, and they will have a similar TV deal. They're going to have a lot of ESPN appearances, and they're also going to be on ESPN+. Plus. That's the big um, thing that ESPN's pushing now to get, you know, to compensate for the loss of subscribers is getting people to purchase the ESPN+. Uh, plus. And so, yeah, BYU would be similar. The only difference, you know, the major difference is, is you can get to a New Year's Six game. Scheduling headaches would subside a little bit for Tom Homo. And, um, you know, I guess fans can debate whether it's a, a smart move or not. So just to clarify, you think that while BYU is in contract negotiations with ESPN right now, whatever that number is will be less than what the Cougars could get with the American Athletic Conference? Absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Tom is having those conversations with ESPN or will have them with ESPN. Um, you know, if, if they're making X number of dollars in the new deal, he may say, well, if we go to the American, what would the number be? And ESPN would tell him. And believe me, the American is going to ESPN. And I know a lot of people twist this, and I understand why they do. But the American will go to ESPN and say, if we had Army, because they have to renegotiate the deal. They've lost a member. It's good faith renegotiations because the conference is different from when you sign the contract. So. They have to renegotiate. So the American will go to ESPN and say, okay, we're, if we add Army, what's the value? And they'll give them a number. And then they'll say, okay, if we add BYU, what's the number? It may be the same, maybe less, maybe more. I, I don't know. And then the American has that information, and then they go back to their membership and say, okay, if we add Army, we, we make this much. If we add BYU, we add this much. And if there's no real big issues with either school, <laughs> surprise, surprise, then they're going to take the school that brings them more revenue. But then I know that it gets twisted by saying, well, ESPN told them to take Team X. ESPN didn't tell them to take Team X. ESPN told them if you take Team X, you're going to make more money than if you take Team Y. Very well explained, Brett. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to be doing this again soon. So are you cool with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm sure – yeah, I understand the position BYU's in. I, I, I welcome an official statement. I think they have my email – Please send it my way. But I don't think we'll get one. The American, I think they'll put out a statement, and they'll pay, they'll probably say, you know, we're fine at 11 right now. We may consider 12. That's something we'll discuss. So the good news for you guys doing this every day is this will drag on for several months. <laughs> exactly. You'll have pl plenty of fodder, and there will be multiple, multiple, multiple. There will be more reports about BYU's in or BYU's out or Army's in or Army's out or whatever's going on. There will be more of those reports than points that UConn's defense gave up last year in the next six months. And that is a lot. <laughs> Brad, uh, we appreciate the sense of humor. You are a gentleman and a college football scholar. Thanks so much. Talk to you guys soon. Bye. All righty. Brett McMurphy on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, your values, your timeline, your financial future. There's a lot to break down of what Whoa. he discussed. I, I, like I said, I agree with some of it. I disagree with uh, some other points, but uh, we'll certainly break that down over the next couple of days.
The best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Conference realignment oh. lives, Jason. You're speaking my language, Spencer. What in the world? The Yukon Huskies making some big news over the weekend. This courtesy our friend at Brett underscore McMurphy of Stadium Sports. UConn will join the Big East in all sports. Its sponsors likely in 2020, sources told Stadium. It's unknown whether UConn football will remain in the American Athletic Conference, play in another FBS conference, perhaps the MAC or Conference USA, or go independent, the source said. First reported by at Dig Sports Desk. That got the wheels turning, Jason. <laughs> it took about .4 seconds for BYU fans on Twitter to say, hey, if UConn's doing it, why can't BYU do it? Should the Cougars replace UConn in the American Athletic Conference? Jason, seriously, does BYU as a member of the AAC make any sense? Okay, follow me on this. Initial answer, yes. Whoa. Yes. Now, just follow me. Okay. Look, of all of the G5 conferences... The American seems like the one that is the most aggressive in fighting for inclusion. They have a P6 sticker on their helmets for crying out loud. That's what I'm saying. And you know, hey, everybody in this state really loves a sticker. Okay? (laughs) So Those in Salt Lake County particularly. Bumper stickers, certainly. But in, in terms of inclusion, they are the ones that are fighting for it the most and really championing that. BYU already has a relationship with the American due to scheduling. The two have been linked as a possible fit in the past. Geographically, certainly, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Travel would be a nightmare. Correct. But it's something, it's one of those things like it's not, it's never going to be a perfect situation. So if, if travel's the worst thing, then, then I, I guess maybe you can understand that. Yes, it makes sense, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen until there is a clear-cut advantage for BYU to not be independent, they will stay independent. It has to be hands down a better situation in terms of financial, uh, in terms of flexibility. It has to be hands down better for BYU to not be independent. Which is why I say, no, it makes no sense for BYU to join the American Athletic Conference at this time. It is all about timing, and we're now, what we think, under five years away from what we are anticipating could be a major realignment and restructure of college football in 2023 and 2024 when the television rights for three of those five major conferences come up and are renegotiated. This is the time that BYU hopes maybe a conference takes the leap, goes to 16 teams, and then the dominoes start to fall, which would bring BYU back into that conversation to become a member of a Power 5 conference. Sure, if BYU could get a similar financial deal that Boise State has with the Mountain West Conference in the American Athletic Conference and keep their TV rights and all that stuff, yeah, it'd be fun, it'd be great. That's not going to happen. It's not real, people. Let BYU's high maintenance that way. Like, it's unfortunate that Boise State got the deal that BYU wanted in the Mountain West, but it's like the Mountain West learned they knew they needed Boise yeah. State, so they accommodated. BYU is not going to have that luxury with the American. Okay, and I make this comparison a lot because I love candy and I love cars, so I'm going to go the candy route today. BYU in the WAC was M&M's. All right, thin, coated, chocolate chip, delicious, right? They had great success with M&M's. Then the Mountain West comes along. It's like, ooh, peanut M&M's. I like peanut M's. Change it up. It's yes. a little bit better. Okay? After that, how did everybody feel about going independent in 2010 when it was announced? And then in 11. Oh, it's so cool. It's great. Here come the peanut butter M&M's. Yes, this is going to be amazing. Forget the Mountain West and the G5 conferences. BYU's doing something on their own. Now people are getting tired of that. And I feel like this is just the next thing. Oh, the American. This is caramel M&M's. It's going to be no, incredible. Okay, see, I knew it's you, going to be incredible, Jason. I knew where you were going with that. Okay. I am going to put the kibosh on that being the caramel. <laughs> P5 is the caramel. Okay. <laughs> Listen, hear me no, out. No, 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 no. The AAC <laughs> is like the, uh, the, the crispy M&M's. <laughs> Delicious. Okay. 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 But like the, the. Whatever. 
The, up here Carm- okay. is the caramel M and M's. That's P five. That's P five. Fine, I concede. Your crispy M and M's are the American. My point <laughs> is, is, everybody loves something different and new, and it just it's a little bit stagnant. It's a little bit old. <laughs> Jason, in my opinion, the Power Five is the whole stinking candy store. Okay. Wait for the whole candy store with all the M&Ms and everything else that goes along with it. Why trade up for crispy M&Ms or trade down, really, from independence when you could potentially have the whole candy store in four to five years? And if it doesn't happen then, okay. Maybe then you consider a different flavor of M&M, but just wait. Just wait. Also, last I checked, health of the Olympic sports for BYU, better than ever right now in the West Coast Conference. They're fantastic. Better than ever. Can you imagine soccer traveling to the Northeast in November to play a league game in the American? It would be a nightmare. (laughs) Look, if we put the American in the Midwest, one word answer before we move on. One word answer. If the American Conference, the majority of the teams are in the Midwest, does that change your opinion? Travel certainly is a huge part of this because it's expensive. That's more than one. That's more than one word, Spencer. It's expensive. Maybe. Maybe. All right. Now I want M&Ms. And now (laughs) on to topic number two. (laughs) Players switching positions. It's nothing new. In fact, Diane Gawolik, who has switched positions before from corner to safety. Uh Well, on media day, Diane had this to say. I'm just getting ready to play corner, so we'll see. Okay. I'm kind of playing both. It's kind of up in the air right now. Okay. Do you have a preference of, of your favorite position? I kind of like corner more just because it's more physical, and I've made my most plays there, so <laughs> why not like it? All right. As he said, he's preparing to play corner. With that in mind, which position group on the defensive side, Spencer, do you think is the strongest? Oh, man. Dianga Woloku is so much of a football player that he gives the cornerbacks a case as being the strongest position group. He is a ball hawk. He's just around the ball when turnovers happen. So I really like the move by Diane to the cornerback situation. I feel good about the secondary, as good as I really can, because you always wonder about that position at BYU. Diane is a, in his teammates' words, he's a dog. And in the words of Kalani Satake, he can play any position on the field. They feel like he will be the best at corner, and I tend to agree. So he makes a case, but still, the man sitting next to him in that interview clip we just showed you <laughs> leads the group that I think is going to be the best, the linebackers. Zane Anderson and Isaiah Kafusi together leading the linebacker core. You got to love it. Whoever they put in in the middle, and there are a number of guys competing for that position, are going to have a dynamite season because Isaiah and Zane are so good on the outside. And we might even see those two come inside, especially in the nickel side, so on the nickel defense. I like the linebackers led by the experience of Zane Anderson. And Isaiah Kafusi is a different type of mentality. That dude understands – he kind of runs to Cameron Jensen, his approach, the general. Mm -hmm. Like, he's not the fastest guy. But he's always making the play, and he is an incredible leader. BYU hasn't had a leader like Isaiah Kafusi in all aspects of that term in a very long time. And he's a linebacker. You don't have to convince me on the talents of Isaiah Kafusi. I said on this program, I think he is the next great BYU linebacker. He's a leader, man. He is fantastic. And I love the linebacker position at BYU historically. It is fantastic. I don't see any reason why that drops off. I'm not going that direction, though, with my answer. I'm going with the defensive line. Okay. And one of the biggest reasons, pun intended, (laughs) is Kairos Tonga. Understandable. Any position that has Kairos Tonga on it is going to get my vote. This guy's going to be playing in the NFL. Whenever he chooses to go to the next level, he is an absolute nightmare for opponents to try and block. Yes, losing Corbin Kafusi is a big deal, but his brother Devin is more than capable of continuing that legacy of Kafusi's on the defensive line for BYU. You look at guys like Bracken El Bakri, Zach Daw, Lorenzo Fautea, Trajan Peely, all of these guys are beasts. And beyond just the guys who are going to start, I think it's the depth okay. on the defensive line that I like the most and one of the reasons why I'm going with this position. And if you think about it, dominant defensive fronts have always been a staple of Kalani Satake defenses. He and Elisa Tuiaki have been building that position since they got here to BYU a few years ago, and I think it pays off this season. I like the defense as a whole. I do too. Secondary, linebackers, defensive front. I think BYU has a very solid group on the defensive side of the ball. The big question is, 
how dynamic can the offense be? Because I think the defense is right where we expect them to be after the Bronco Mendenhall years. And especially in 2012 and 2013 when they were so good and so deep and sent so many guys to the NFL, this is a group that could put multiple guys into the National Football League on the defensive side. I like it. So I don't, I, it's hard for me, it was hard for me to answer because I'm like, man, I'm picking between, I think, three solid position yeah. groups. Yeah. And you know who will be facing that great defense? Hit it. The countdown to the youths. 66 days. 66 oh, days away. Oh, yeah. We're getting there. We are getting there. Again, it started at like 240-something. Terrible. No. Now it's at 66. 66 <laughs> days away. Uh, Tom Bell is our number 66 shout-out today. Played for the Cougars throughout the 70s. 1996 BYU Hall of Famer. Helped the Cougars to the first undefeated regular season in football history. Two-time All-WAC first team. APL All-American honorable mention. Tom Bell, shout-out, brother. What's up? 65 days. Okay, 65. We're close to two months away. Yeah. yeah. Later, we're, later we're this week? That mark. We're hitting that mark, right? 60 days is like, okay, within two months. That's getting real because then we're, ab- we're, we're coming up on one month to fall camp, which is in the summer. But anyway, we always talk about that. Yeah, BYU, one of the first schools to open training yeah. camp. They're, yeah, they're, BYU's not the only game on Thursday. You know, no, there, are, there are a bunch of There's games. There's like 10 games. But they but are one of the feature games. They're I one think of the they're top. The, I think they're the best game. One of the top two yeah. games yeah. on that Thursday night. By the way, number 65, our shout-out today, Dallas Reynolds. Yeah. Of the long-tenured Reynolds family within the annals of BYU football Reynolds history. Reynolds rep. 2005, 2008, three-time All-American. 64 days. 64 days away. That's how many. And a shout-out to Andy Reid, former number 64 for the BYU Cougars in blue. Offensive lineman from 1978 to 1980. 63 days. Or starting running back, that yeah, is. I we think... know who the starting quarterback's going to be. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Will the starting running back be Jaron Hall? Question mark? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Next. Wait, there's a question about the starting quarterback at BYU? Why are we not talking about oh, this? Oh, hold on. Boy. We already have the American to oh, uh, stir up the pot. Let's stir oh, up the pot in boy. July with that. <laughs> Didn't we quarterback that controversy. We did 2019. That April, I think, right? Uh, yeah. Quarterback on the mind. Yeah, always. 62 days. Uh, nine weeks from yesterday. Does it feel a little bit more real now? It's getting there. Which, by the way, this is the first time I'm uh, I'm gonna say this on the show. We're gonna do a two hour countdown in the kickoff. Hey, Heyo! For the Utah game. You think it's worth it? Two hours, baby. With all like, of the let's build go. up. Let's go. <laughs> Got that approved yesterday. Yeah, it starts to feel real when BYU opens up training camp, right? Then it's like, okay, it's on the countdown to yeah. a real. Yeah, we're a month away. On. We're playing. They're in. Pay- yeah, but yeah. hey, sixty two days. We'll take it. Wonderful. Stay up to date with the countdown. Every weekday on BYU Sports Nation, on BYU TV, and BYU Radio. Hear are what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. We now welcome in on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline the commissioner of the American Athletic Conference, Mike Oresco. Mike, it's been a while. Great to have you back on the show. How are you? Hey, thank you. Uh, very well, Spencer. How about, how about you? And, and Jerome, th- thank you, Jerron. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you, you, you got it, man. Uh, it's been a crazy last week for you, and that's probably putting it lightly. How would you define the past week since news broke that UConn was leaving the conference? Well, you know, uh, we've been through it before, but it is uh, not remotely the same. It's not even close to what it was seven years ago. We're a strong, powerful conference now. We're well-established. Uh, this will uh, we'll move on from this. Not going to change anything we're doing. Not going to you know change our commitment to competing at the highest national. I stress national level in football, men's and women's basketball, Olympic sports, where we're also very good. Uh, we uh, we're going to continue to move forward with our Power Six campaign uh, uh, and certainly pursue our autonomy goal. As you know, football drives a lot of this, and, and we are really really strong in football. Uh, we'll probably even be stronger uh, in football down the road. Uh, you turn a problem into an opportunity. Uh, at basketball, probably what's been camouflaged, uh, fellas, in this is that we're really a good basketball league. 
Uh, UConn hadn't contributed much to our basketball. I think they're going to get better, and I think they would have been a, a factor in our league. But the fact is, even without them, we're going to be really good in basketball. Uh, so, you know, again, I think we're viewing this as business as usual. Let's get through the exit process, and let's just continue to move forward. Obviously, and I'm sure you'll want to talk about it, we, we have some decisions to make on membership. But uh, other than that, I think, you know, we're in the best shape we've been in in our history. What would be some of the contributing factors to why you would perhaps want to replace UConn as a 12th member in at least football only? Well, we're not anxious to do anything. And, um, you know, the only time we would even think about it is if a school would bring uh, additional value in terms of our brand, in terms of our strength, in terms of TV, in terms of, of, uh, you know, a cultural and strategic fit for the future. Uh, if somebody that, that really had those attributes were to call us, and they would have to call us. We're not calling anybody. I, I want to make it very clear to everybody. We're not reaching out to anyone. Uh, if, if people, they know our phone number. If anybody's interested in us, they'll call us. And if they don't, then it means they weren't interested to begin with. I think, by the way, we will probably know, uh, fellas, within, well, two or three weeks when we meet in Newport, Rhode Island, for our media day, which direction uh, we're likely to go in. I, I think, you know, this is, you know, it's a process that uh, we'll talk about. But the other thing I would reiterate is we can stay at 11. We, we, again, we're, we're very happy at 11. We've got 11 good schools. And basketball, as I said, we're really good in basketball, too. We don't need to worry about basketball, even though we are losing UConn. Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American Athletic Conference, with us on BYU Sports Nation. When that news about UConn broke, it took all of about .4 seconds for BYU fans and many national pundits to say, hey, BYU's a football independent. They might be a perfect fit for the American Athletic Conference with the parameters that you just laid out. Would BYU, hypothetically speaking, be a desired fit for your conference? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Here's what I would say, though. BYU is obviously a great program. It's a great national program. It has a ton of history. I go back 30 or 35 years with BYU from my days at ESPN. Uh, you know, in the 80s, I, I put BYU on a lot. Uh, you know, I've been out there. I've, I've spoken to the Cougar Club on, on uh, more than one occasion. I've been treated, uh, you know, like royalty out there. Everybody there has been wonderful to me. Tom Holmo is a close friend. Kevin Worthen, the president, has been terrific. Uh, we have just enormous respect for BYU, and I have great affection because I go back to, you know, obviously, uh, you know, to the days when, you know, BYU, uh, you know, played in, in the old WAC, and, and, you know, obviously Glenn Tuckett was a, a, a close friend. Uh, you know, we all, we all revered Lavelle. Uh, there's just so much history there. So I can't say enough good things about BYU. But having said that, uh, we, you know, we've got a lot of thinking to do about this. But by, by the way, BYU has shown no interest in joining a conference, none, zero, from what we can see. Uh, you know, and again, there are some schools, and I'm not going to go into it. Uh, if they called us, I get, you know, we would certainly listen. We would certainly talk to them. Uh, you know, geography is always an issue in these things. It's not the decisive thing. Uh, you know, we probably was with San Diego State years ago when they, they and Boise were going to come in. And once Boise decided not to, they wanted their own TV deal. We wouldn't let them do it. Uh, they couldn't do it and stay in our conference, just as UConn's not going to be able to stay in our conference in football. Uh, we, uh, we decided that San Diego State was just too much of an outlier out on the West Coast. just didn't make sense. Football, you can do things that you can't do in basketball because you only, in our case, you only have four road games because we play an eight-game schedule. Anyway, that, that's where, where we are on this, uh, and we'll see what happens. The campaign to be a Power Six conference is really interesting given that the Big East was one and then there was a rebrand and the Big East is a basketball league separate and whatnot. So is there any way that the Power Five is going to let uh, the American be validated and sanctioned as a power conference in the future? Like, is there anything uh, the American Athletic Conference can do? We think, we think so. We think it's inevitable. We think we're obviously getting closer to them every day. We've, we've had almost 40 P5 wins. Uh, we play them. We, we win. We've been in four of the six New Year's Day Bowls. We've won three of them. would have won four if Mackenzie Milton had been healthy in all likelihood. You know, we, we've done everything we need to do. We're, we're really good in basketball. Uh, our schools are big. We're in big markets. We have all sorts of benefits. 
uh, it's going to happen. I just don't know when, and, and we'll, we'll knock the door down eventually, I believe. I really do believe that. Uh, I don't think they can keep us out because the whole system's going to lack credibility. If, if we're clearly a P6, and I think we are, uh, you know, they'll say, well, you don't have the resources we have. Well, guess what? The new TV deal gives us enough resources to compete at an even higher level than we've been competing at, and we've done pretty well with, with the revenue we had, which was, you know, relatively small compared to, to what we'll get. PAC-12 doesn't get anywhere near the revenue that the SEC or the Big Ten gets uh, or the ACC will get, but they're nevertheless a P-5 conference. Uh, we have an interesting group of schools that in the new world of college football, in the new world of social media, of cable television, of great, of great exposure, have really uh, distinguished themselves and really made great strides and have become something that they weren't maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago. And, fellows, that's because of the conference they're in. You know, they've done it in the American. You saw what UCF's done the last two years. They've become a certified grade-A national brand. Houston has done unbelievable things. Memphis, twice on beautiful sunny Saturdays, they upset Ole Miss and they upset UCLA on ABC. <laughs> national TV. That, that did a lot for their brand. And, and Memphis, you know, was not, you know, they always had good football, but it wasn't at this level. Same thing with Cincinnati and others. When, when this league got formed, I always felt it had great potential if it stayed together. And that's been proven out. Mike Oresco, commissioner of the AAC, with us on BYU Sports Nation on a Friday. As far as a football-only proposition goes, with the likes of BYU or another school, how open are you to adding just a football member to make the football conference 12? We'd be open to it, but we're not, you know, we're, we're not committed to it by any means. We're open to it, but I think we are also extremely open to staying at 11. If we stay at 11, we'd need a waiver, but we think we can get it from the NCAA to play a championship game. We're not going to give up our championship game under any circumstances. It's too valuable for all sorts of reasons, including to ESPN. But if we played a championship game with our two best teams, for example, and we did a schedule similar to the Big Tens uh, that they did for 20 years with, with Penn State, and by the way, we've talked to the Big Ten office. We have good friends there, and they've told us how they did it and how they preserved certain rivalries like Ohio State-Michigan. We would absolutely have to make maintain UCF, USF every year. Houston, SMU is a Texas rivalry we'd probably want to maintain. It's totally doable. We'd need the waiver. And we'd say to the NCAA, and, and it would be an FBS decision, why wouldn't you want to give us a waiver and, and probably pass legislation? Because, uh, first of all, it should be our business how we determine our champion, not somebody else's. Second, why would you encourage us to add a 12th team and raid another conference, perhaps, in order to get a championship game? Why would you encourage us to, to jettison a team to get back to 10 because you can play a championship game with 10? A lot of this is arbitrary. Uh, it's been, you know, it's been, the legislation has been piecemeal. It's been done on the basis of, okay, the Big 12's got a problem. Let's solve it by passing legislation. Uh, the the Sunbelt has a problem. Let's solve it by passing legislation. That's the way it's been done. And we would say, look, why don't you just pass a rule that allows people to do it the way they want to? And in lieu of that, we would certainly want to have legislation or a waiver at the outset to be able to play with 11 teams and, and still play a championship game when we don't do a round robin. We're clearly not going to do a round robin with 11 teams. You know, and, and, and we want to preserve the eight-game schedule for the reasons I, I uh, enumerated earlier. So I think it's all doable. I, I don't know which way we'll ultimately go. I have an inclination that we'll be, be, be likely to stay at 11. Uh, and as I said, if, if people call us and it makes sense, we'll listen. Uh, and I'm not mentioning, you know, people ask me about teams in the G5. I didn't want to mention anyone. Uh, the last thing I want to do, fellas, is rile the college community. We're not going to keep conferences on tenter hooks. You know, if in three or four years, for example, there was a team that emerged that really wasn't there now, you could argue that UCF wouldn't have been there 10 years ago, but look at them now. I think we would entertain, if they had an interest in the conference, and they would have to have an interest in us, we would entertain that. Uh, but I don't think we need to, and we're fortunate that we don't need to. And I say this, again, without any smugness. Uh, we, we know how good we are. We know how, how hard we've worked to get there. And I don't think there's any way we would do anything that didn't enhance our brand. Mike, it's great to talk to you. Incredible points you bring up. Uh, we appreciate you uh, in your busy schedule taking time to answer some uh, some tough questions and questions that really are are tough to answer. So, as always, your class act. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that, uh, Spencer and Jerron. And, and by the way, 
again, I, I just want to say hi to the community there and to, to BYU because, again, we have that wonderful relationship. I, I wouldn't want anybody to read anything into that, but I just want to, again, uh, say that we, we, we do have a, a great friendship with, with Tom and, and with, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Worthen and, and all the people there. And, uh, again, uh, compliments to the community, and thanks for having me. Appreciate you got it. it. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Mike Oresco on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, your values, your timeline, your financial future. I want to bring up a sentence that he just put out there in the last 60 seconds. I have an inclination that we're likely to stay at 11 teams. Yeah, he made that very clear, that they're looking at both options, which is stay or expand, but that they would be just fine with the 11. And he's right. I think the AAC has overtaken the Mountain West. The Mountain West, when BYU was in it with Utah and TCU, was a fantastic conference in football and basketball. There was, there was a year where there were three teams in the top 25, which is something that the AAC has been producing the last couple of years, right, with the likes of UCF and Cincinnati recently and Memphis and Navy until I think last year, right? They have some really good programs. Obviously, in basketball, they have good schools. We saw it firsthand with Houston. We're going to see it again, BYU at Houston this year. Um, you know, UConn has struggled in basketball the last couple of years, and that's probably the reason that they have moved is, well, we missed the Big East. We thrived in the Big East. Let's go back there. Their women's team went 124-0 and in conference It doesn't play. matter. They could play, <laughs> yeah, everybody As else. As he said, they'll beat everyone else wherever yeah, they're, they're playing. They're good. So it doesn't and, – and they're not reaching out. The schools have to reach – back out to them. How about that? So lots to break down from that. Yeah, he made that clear as well. We're not calling anybody. Yeah. We'll we'll take phone calls, but we're not calling anybody. That's my number one goal with my phone as well. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. He is the college football preseason magazine guru, Phil Steele, ESPN College Football Insider and Contributor as well. Phil, nice to have you back on the program. Hey, a real pleasure, guys. How are you doing today? Fantastic. Uh, we feel like uh, we're getting closer to college football because we have you on the program. And what's your typical day like right now, now that your uh, 2019 college football preview magazine has been released? Uh, this is living the life right now, guys. I tell you what, uh, you know, the magazine is six months of deadlines and stress. And then in the month of June, I basically go through every game for the upcoming season. So once again, you're on deadlines. But I've gone through every game for the upcoming season, projected who I had favored, who I had underdog, games I've had toss-ups. And now I'm just getting to talk football all day long, and I'm working like 40, 50 hours a week. It's hardly like even working, guys. (laughs) That's it? Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, Let's talk about where you have BYU. You have them at number 38. Is that a preseason ranking, or is that uh, what you think they'll end up this year? That's where I think they're going to end up this year. And, uh, you know, when I look at BYU, they're a – a talented team. They've got 17 returning starters coming back. Not wild about the schedule. I mean, the first, the only team in the country to open up with four power five teams in the first four games. But despite the tough schedule and despite the fact that, you know, you can make a case for them winning or losing each of their first seven games, I think they come out of that first seven games, four and three, three and four, and then finish off real strong down the stretch. And but the amount of games they would win in that seven-game stretch, they're going to have to pull some upsets in there, maybe a USC, maybe a Washington. I think that gets them into the top 40 at the end of the year. ESPN College Football Insider Phil Steele on BYU Sports Nation. What's the realistic best-case scenario for BYU with a win-loss record in 2019? You want me to put on my uh, blue sunglasses Yes, here please. And, blue uh, goggles. <laughs> Well, I would have to say, you know, when I uh, – let's say absolute best case scenario, I'm a true dive blue BYU fan. There's no game on the schedule they can't win this year. I mean, there's every single game. The, the biggest underdog I have them in all year is the opening game against Utah, a six-point underdog. All the rest of the games, they're either favored or a slight underdog at that. So there's there's no unwinnable games at the schedule. So if you want to push the full gauntlet, and by no means am I calling for it, but – if I'm if I'm a BYU fan, uh, I, I would think that the best case scenario would be 11, 12 wins. Wow! You mentioned hey. you mentioned that you have nine sets uh, and two said BYU winning ten plus. You said your main set calls for seven wins. We feel pretty similar. Somewhere between seven and nine is probably where BYU ends up. What do you think realistically ends up happening if this team is the thirtieth? 
best team in the country? Uh, I came up with uh, looking at the schedule. I'm going to go with eight wins. I think that you know you look at the early first four games: Utah at Tennessee, home to USC, home to Washington. Maybe an underdog in all four, but a slight underdog. I think they can win one or two of those games at Toledo. Toledo is my pick to win the MAC. Uh, the Mac West, I should say. They're tough at home. That's not going to be an easy game, but it's a winnable game. USF is a team that last year was probably the fakest team in college football. They opened up 7-0, and but they were beating a bunch of weaklings and barely beating them at that. When they played bowl teams, they got crushed. They are a better team this year. They've got the heat and humidity of Florida. That makes that one a toss-up game. The Boise State game, to me, is a toss-up game, but I think BYU can win that one at home. Got them a slight favorite in that. So when I look at the schedule, lots of toss-up games. I'm I'm going to go with eight as my magic number for BYU this year. You mentioned that you expect the BYU offense to put up its best numbers since at least 2014. Why is that, Phil? Well, a big part of it is the quarterback, Zach Wilson. I'm very impressed with him down the stretch last year, especially in the bowl game. Uh, I think when you add in a running back like Tyson Williams from South Carolina, they go along with Katoa, who I think Katoa is, could very well be the feature back this year as well. You look at the receiving core, uh, I love the tight ends led by Matt Bushman. Uh, they could run a lot of 12 personnel, and the offensive line looks like it's going to be solid. So I think the straw that stirs the drink, though, is quarterback Zach Wilson. And I think him playing anywhere near like he did in the bowl game, this is a BYU offense that's going to be much improved. And you feel like he's going to take a, a leap, perhaps. You mentioned that he could be one of the, or should be, one of the top quarterbacks in FBS. So you feel very highly about Zach Wilson. I do. I like what I saw of him last year. You know, last year you're looking at a true freshman that steps in and uh, completes 66% of his passes, tosses just three interceptions all year. Uh, Coach Sataki was only expecting perfection out of him in the bowl game, and that's what he got. And uh, I, I think when you look at Wilson's second year in that offense, now a true sophomore, you know, I'm going to go back and throw out another true freshman quarterback from last year, and that would be uh, USC's quarterback. Came in a little bit more highly rated coming out of high school, but Going through the rigor, the rigors of a first-year starting quarterback, JT Daniels, 14 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. That's more like a true freshman. I expect big things out of Zach Wilson this year. Now to the defensive side of the ball for BYU. You project that the Cougars at 23 points allowed per game and 322 yards are going to be a pretty formidable defense. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball, why do you feel strongly that BYU can compete under Kalani Satake? You know, they lose some key players this year on defense, which is always a a negative, like uh, Taki Taki at the linebacker spot, also Kafusi up front at the defensive end spot, who contributed eight and a half sacks. So you lose your leading tackler, you lose your top sack guy, you think there might be a step back. But when I look at BYU, you know, you look at the first of all, let's take a look at layer by layer. The defensive line, they actually returned 10 of their top 12 defensive line. And going through the team with Coach Sataki, like I do every year, I thought they had better depth on the D-line, much better depth on the defense overall last year than they had the previous year. And this year, that depth is solid once again. You go to linebacking court, you know, two of the projected returning starters last year, uh, Anderson and uh, Poe, uh, both came in and uh, got injured. They played three and four starts combined. Uh, Anderson's back this year, by the way. When he was still the number seven tackler despite just four starts. So I think despite losing their top linebacker like they do to the Browns, the number three draft pick, that you're going to see their linebacking core be solid. Then the secondary, uh, you know, practically everybody's back. So that's a big plus there. So this is a veteran secondary, a veteran defense, eight starters back. Last year they only gave up 21.4 points per game. I'm calling for a slight regression to 23 points per game, but that's still pretty solid, especially in today's game of hurry-up offenses. Kalani Sataki is entering his fourth season uh, as the head coach here. Nine and four, four and nine, seven and six. He's one game over 500. What are your impressions of uh, Kalani Sataki and the direction BYU is headed with him? You know, he's a guy that loves football, loves BYU. I think he's a guy that's uh, going to take BYU to the next step in the in the near future. I think uh, you know you'll go back to the the 2017 season that was a disaster but last year they got their footing on the right path i love the fact they went in and beat wisconsin on the road that was a huge win early in the season and i think a big reason that coach sataki's uh, here again this year so i, I like the, the job he's doing and i think you're going to continue to see byu's fortunes rise phil it's great to catch up with you uh good luck with your slower 40 to 50 hour week of work schedule 
Yeah, it's pretty easy this time of year. Really enjoying it. Great talking football with you guys today. All right, Phil, thanks so much. Phil Steele on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, your values, your timeline, your financial future. So he thinks eight wins. That's the goal we've said. Okay, go get eight, right? The blue goggled version is ten, which is also fun. Oh, man. (laughs) Ten would be amazing. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. All right, let's start here. Buy, sell, or hold. Joe Lenardi not having BYU included on his latest bracketology. Uh, Hold. Jury's still out. Um, BYU was a 19-win team that didn't make the NIT, and they add Jake Toulson. We think they're going to make a bigger jump than anybody else thinks. But we also work at BYU. The paycheck says BYU. And uh, I have these blue goggles. So I don't think it's too blue goggled, though, to think that BYU could make the NCAA tournament. We think that's the standard. We think the talent's there. We think development from Connor Harding and Gavin Baxter is going to be such that, and the new coaching staff. I think the new coaching staff is probably the biggest X factor or Y factor in this whole thing. I understand why Joe Lenardi doesn't have him in. So I'm buying his logic because he has to look at this as, well, what has BYU done recently? I know they have a ton Nothing. of Nothing. you got to prove it. you got to oh. go on the court and prove it. So right now yeah. I'm buying this logic. I think, like you, that BYU will earn his respect and they'll show up in bracketology at some point, if not multiple points throughout the college basketball season. But right now I'm, I'm buying this logic because I can understand it. And it's more than just last year. It's the previous four seasons yes. total where BYU didn't make the tourney and, in fact, wasn't really that close. And they had the talent, or so we thought, to do so in at least one of those seasons, Oh, right? yeah, sure. One. Yeah. 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 Yay, one. Next. Buy, sell, or hold. Brandon Davies, 21 boards in a game being more impressive than Jimmer going 40-plus in China. Now, it, this is interesting. Jimmer in China in a domestic league there. Foreign to him, but domestic there. Okay. Right? Versus international play, where you have the best players from these countries, Uganda and Kenya. I think Jimmer's 40 is more impressive. I think... Uh, rebounding is a uh, skill you can acquire, and, and you got to be good at it. It's difficult, but I think scoring is harder than rebounding. How big is the Kenyan national team? I mean, uh, <laughs> come on. Like, <laughs> they can't have that many guys bigger than Brandon Davies, yeah, is right? Is Brandon that, like, the alpha that shows up at the church ball game? He's the 6'11 guy, and there's some 6'4 like, guy, and he's like, okay, that was easy. Yes, 40 points in a game. Is really hard to do. I don't care. I, I hear the Kenyans do, do have great durability, though. Yes. Great stamina. They, they, hey, all transition? four quarters. All four quarters. Dude, they're I, yeah, excellent I, in transition. I get that. Yeah. In terms of height, like, are they are those guys oversizing Brandon Davies? No. Twenty one rebounds happen for a reason. I got to go with forty points. It's hard he's, to do. He's a good rebound. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next one. Last one. Buy, sell, or hold BYU as the dominant force. In USA Volleyball. Hmm. The? No. A? Yes. Uh, on the women's side, BYU is represented by one senior team player, Mary Lake. Penn State has four, Nebraska three, Minnesota four. Okay, so they're not the force. On the men's side, Penn State three, BYU three, Long Beach State three, UCLA three, Irvine four, Stanford three. Pretty good mix so there. BYU is a force, but not the force. I know you're probably referencing Heather Olmstead and Heather Knighting and uh, Ronnie Jones Perry. And Luca Lana. Slabe and yeah. Rob Nielsen. Yeah. And- Cert- certainly a force. I wouldn't say the force, though. Yeah, the coaches, if you add the coaches into the players on the roster, like there is a significant – uh, fingerprint Amy of BYU Gant as an analyst yes. with Team USA on well. the volleyball sure. program. Oh, yeah, yeah. A force. Trust me, I'm the most biased volleyball guy here, but no, A force. Yes, yeah, A force, not D force, and yeah. that's okay. It, yes. That's incredible. If BYU uh, had won a couple of national championships recently, I might argue the force. But BYU has not won a national title in women's, and BYU has not won in men's since '04. Yeah, I think we're collectively selling on that. But that's not to say that BYU yes. isn't incredible yeah. and has a crazy fingerprint on USA Volleyball as a whole. Absolutely. It's fun to watch. It really is. I'm paying attention. We're paying attention, right? So, yeah. So. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The head coach of BYU football, Kalani Satake, joining us. Thanks for dressing up, coach. Thank you. <laughs> it's to distract the weight I gained during the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Did you gain weight during the summer? I don't know. I'm just thinking I'm co- consistently gaining weight every year, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I 
I told you my, my, my diet is the resurrection. That's my diet plan. <laughs> That's yeah. a diet plan. That's a wonderful plan. Yeah. Well, so far you've done, is this your second interview of the day? This is, yeah. Okay, so and, well, the third. Third already. Because I did Lauren earlier. Oh, yeah, web chats. Yep. Third interview of uh, 72 um, today. The yeah, 72 days, days to, away. You have 72 interviews to, to celebrate. I'm going to say the same thing over and over again. Well, Can give us wait. some fresh stuff. Yeah, I'll if, give if you, you guys the yeah. good stuff. Yeah, some good stuff. We're on Watch ESPN, too. So, uh, uh, okay, 2019 season. Um, it's been a while since 2018, obviously. Some high notes to kind of end the year there and uh, some guys recovering from injury. How are you feeling today? I feel really good. I mean, I think you can sense the excitement on our from our players and from our coaches. And uh, I think, you know, we talk about wanting the game already to be here. And so um, I, I haven't felt this much excitement about the season opener in a long time. And so uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I think the the players are the ones that are feeding the um, the energy to it, to that. You know, and normally I think you kind of go through the, the normal stage of getting closer to the game. But this is one where the... The players have just been antsy about it, and so they're they're they're, they're excited, and, and uh, it shows in the way they're preparing and the way that they're they're uh, going through the conditioning, and, and even the guys that are healed up from the injuries. There's, there's just a, there's a, a mission in mind right now. Speaking of fresh things, we just talked about Cougar Canyon and BYU athletic marketing in collaboration with the universities, working really hard to create a more uh, enjoyable game day experience. So knowing what you know about this Cougar Canyon and the build-up to Utah, what do you, what do you anticipate game day is going to be like on August 29th? Well, I'm excited for it. I think it's a really good idea and uh, to get the fans all there earlier and kind of have a really good experience, you know. And I think this has been something that, that the fans have been hungry for for a long time, and, and I'm glad that um, you know that, that our marketing department, David Almodova, and everyone uh, has, is going to make this work because I think this is going to be bigger than what people even anticipate. And, and anytime you can put a lot of food around the same spot, that's a good sign for me, right? And so we're going to have a Kruger walk go through it. And, and I think our, um, you know, I think this is something that's really familiar in a lot of different places. And I think it only makes sense that we do that here at BYU. Not only will you have this great experience, there'll be an inherent great experience with the games you've scheduled. So yeah. the, the first three home games are amazing, right? Utah, USC, and Washington. So if you don't already have your tickets, you're going to get them because this is as good of a home schedule in the first three that BYU's ever had. Of course. And then even the future schedules that are coming, you know, that are people are coming to Provo to play us. And um, I mean, even looking at, at Boise and, and Liberty that spring and Hugh Freeze, who was at Ole Miss for such a long time. And so... There's a lot of big-time programs that are coming in, and um, to have three of them in, in within a, m- a month is crazy, you know. And so I, I, I mentioned that that's a, that's a great thing that Tom Homo has done as our athletic director of scheduling, and and with the partnership with with ESPN, it made this possible. And uh, when I was trying to get the job as a head coach, uh, that was one thing that I was really attracted to that that we were going to play these type of schedules and these difficult games and. Um, you know, we we had we've had some memorable moments in 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 our BYU history. Uh, now we have opportunities to do it all within the same season. So hopefully we can capitalize on the schedule that we have and, and uh, make some great moments for our fans. BYU football head coach Kalani Satake with us on BYU Sports Nation, part of our 2019 Media Day coverage. Before you go through this very challenging and exciting schedule, obviously you go through training camp in late summer and. There's always some unique differences between each way you approach these training camps. So what will be unique and different about uh, the way that you coach you guys up this late summer? Well, I think having a system that's already been in place for a little while, you know, on the offensive side. Defensively, we're pretty much going with the same stuff. We've added a few um, things here and there, and uh, you'll see it on game time, you know. But um, I think offensively, just to have being familiar with everything, um, I think Jeff Grimes and Aaron Roderick, Steve Clark, Eric Mateos, you know, Fessy Sitake, those guys have done an amazing job. AJ Stewart at getting that whole group ready. And um, I, I've seen a huge step. You see some big steps from year one to year two, but this I've seen a lot of change, a lot of for, – for, for the good, right, uh, in our offensive side. And that's because we have really good quarter, young quarterbacks that can lead the way. And we have – I mean, Jaron Hall is, has done a great job in spring ball, and getting all those reps have made made a, a big um, has made him grow up a lot, a lot faster than we've seen, and um, so and then also having Zach sit out and watch and be a coach has helped him out. So um, I feel really good about that position group um, right now. And then we've added a couple um, 
guys on our running back depth to help us if if we had the same issue of injuries again. And we feel really good about our young O line that um, is really experienced, and they all come back next year. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I think most of them come back in the two deep, with the exception of Tom Schof. Yeah, that's great. You'll have four of those five next year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more like six or seven. Let's break down some of those guys. So Zach Wilson, obviously, he just said he expects to be 100% going into fall camp. Uh, Phil Steele has the quarterback position ranked 18th in the country. How do you feel about Zach Wilson and Jaron Hall going into 2019, two dynamic dual threats? I feel really good about them, and I love what Aaron Roderick's done with them and what Jeff Grimes has done with them, and um, allowing them, allow, just empowering them with the offense. Um, and I think Zach is a true freshman. It's always hard for a new guy to come in that is a, out of high school, right, and to say, hey, let's do it this way. And, and now he's earned that right. I think it's just it's just what ha- comes with the territory being a true freshman. Um, but but also Jaron is not, not one that's a, that's a similar situation. He's a return missionary, been around, he's competed, he won baseball games and things like that, you know. So, Redshirted last year. Yeah, and, 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 and even played, you know. So we're looking forward to him being on the field and competing. But we really feel good about Beto Romney and also feel good about Joe Critchlow in that group as well. Now, those four guys gives us a really uh, deep group, and we feel really – I mean, you're looking at the last nine years, uh, the history of our quarterbacks the last nine years has not been good. So, um, you know, hopefully we don't get to – we don't have to use multiple quarterbacks, but – um we're ready just in case. And I think taking these steps and being ready in case anything happens, it's a difficult thing to do as a coach, but you have to prepare for the worst, but expect the best. Is Jaron Hall su- such a good athlete that you might consider using him on the field with Zach on the field? We could, but I, but I, I think um, I think that really diminishes his preparation. You know, I think that um, allowing him to compete for the quarterback position is going to be really important for his um, progress as a quarterback, and that's what we brought him here to do: is be a quarterback. And Kyler Murray, uh, Kyler Murray, showing everyone that you only have to really have one year to play, and um, you know, to make a difference. And so, I, I think he's got the opportunity to. First of all, we want him to compete, and the next thing is, is we know what he brings to the table with his leadership, and um, so we're, we're, we're focused on him as a quarterback. He will always be a quarterback here, and um, and and. But I think it'd be crazy for us not to try to use him in other ways. But he is not a a um, what do you call it, a wildcat type of quarterback? That's not his role. He could he could throw the ball. He just happens to be a really good athlete. And same with Zach. They, they could all, all those quarterbacks I mentioned. They can all play different positions. But I think in order for them for us to have a, a solid group, they have to stay in that spot. What do you want to talk about that you're not going to get asked? Let's just do it right now. My, I don't know. I, I don't know what it's going to be. But BYU football or not? It, it's going to be maybe my food choice <laughs> for lunch. Yeah. What do, you, what do you want for lunch? I don't know, but there's there's like I saw on my on my itinerary that I had to do a spicy food challenge. Really, it's a bad idea. Just so <laughs> everyone should know. It's, it's not the, so I think we should avoid that one. You, you might have to cancel the interviews after that. I think we'll have to make Brecken L. Bakri do it or something. <laughs> yeah, he's up for anything. He's, yes. he's game for all of yes. it. So yeah, that's how about this? Who's the DJ during training camp? Oh gosh. I, Jack DeMooney is kind of he wants that that title, right? Do you want to give that to Jack? I don't know. I just there's, there's a, I, I'm so I, I'm not even really knowing noticing the music until players start to dance, and then I think that's probably we need to go back to the '90s that they don't know. You know what I mean? '80s and '90s and stuff like that. That's our wheelhouse. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. <laughs> shout out to Montel Jordan and Vanilla Ice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you were playing. We, you guys are making me look feel old. I, I like all the new stuff too. You know, yeah. just if any recruits are watching, I'm kind of I'm on. You know, I'm hip to all of it. So and these guys are trying to Use make the me word hip though. Come these on, guys are trying to make me look old. <laughs> Kalani, it's great to talk to you. you guys Congratulations are awesome. on surviving interview number three. Uh, you know, you've got yeah, seventy ish to go on that spicy food. Guys, challenge, man. I think Jeff Grimes said it. This is the highlight of the summer for me. So looking forward to it. And anytime Let's you hope get, it's not. Uh, I, I, I know I'm being jo- I'm joking, but really, this is a chance to talk about BYU football in yeah. June, yeah. and um, that means that the season is about to start, and we're 72 days away. Yep. And for a bunch of guys that are really anxious for the game, this is a great moment for us. Coach, go Cougs! Always a pleasure. Okay, thanks, Kalani. All right, guys. Appreciate it, man. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. And catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV 
and BYU Radio.